Okay, everybody, we're going to resume. I hope everybody had a good lunch. Do I need to do it? Am I advancing his slides? Okay, is that okay? Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so I have no announcements for you, so we're just going to jump right into the afternoon session. Uh, our first speaker, our invited speaker is Dr. Sean Marshall, who it is my great pleasure to introduce. Um, Sean is professor and division head of physical medicine and rehab at the University of Ottawa and the Ottawa Hospital. And he's going to be talking about the living concussion guidelines for adults. Um, Sean Marshall is a specialist in physical medicine and rehab and professor and division head of physical medicine rehab at U of Waterloo, U of Ottawa and Ottawa Hospital, also department head of physical medicine and rehab at Briere Continuing Care. His clinical practice focuses on ABI rehab, where Dr. Marshall manages inpatients as well as outpatient clinics for persons with moderate to severe TBIs. He is also involved in assessment and treatment of persons with mild TBI slash concussion and persisting symptoms. He has a master's of science degree in epidemiology and community health and is active in research involving brain injury rehab, concussion, and persisting symptoms, as well as driving and disability. So... Please take it away, Sean. Thanks very much, Robin. I'm going to hopefully share my screen. And from there, screen three, we can go. So, um, and one second. So hopefully you're seeing my slides now. And if you are, then we're good to go. OK, great. Well, I'm very, I see a thumbs up. We're ready to go. Well, thank you for the introduction. And again, I'm. I'm just uh, honored to be invited to present on the living concussion guidelines, which, um, you know, uh, for, for adults. And uh, I'm going to talk about in the presentation objectives. So hopefully to describe the need for an adult living concussion guideline and what that means versus a traditional clinical practice guideline. I won't go into too much detail about it, but just want to give you that background. And I want to review the scope and the features of the adult living concussion guidelines really to convince you why they're a good resource and why you should access them and hopefully um, help us out to continue with them. And the third thing I'd like to do is to present a practical case study using the guidelines return to activity section to demonstrate how a healthcare provider might help someone return to work after a concussion. And I'm gonna go through information there. Hopefully there'll be time for questions. Um, I think I've arranged it as such and move ahead and happy to take any questions. All right, so I just wanna highlight here, um, uh, next slide, just a second, screen, there we go. And traditional systematic review. So systematic review currency and accuracy is challenged by the increasing rate of research output. So even today at the conference, you've been exposed to, to new information about concussion and it's increasingly changing. Uh, the median survival of a systematic review, and this is more recent, is 2.9 years. Traditionally, when I started off the guidelines, we'd start off the version, and we'd wait around for five years for things to change. Um, ChatGPT, um, uh, you know, over 5,000 articles are published with the term concussion in the abstract in 2021. So I used ChatGPT and said, hey, ChatGPT, like, how many articles a year are published with concussion? This is what it came up with. That's a lot. Obviously, as clinicians, we're not going to go through this. And this is the method in which we're going to get this information distilled down. So traditional updated views are inefficient. An author and team and staff need to be assembled every time. So this being our the equivalent of our fourth edition, um, I can say that, you know, that's what happened. We do the first edition, said, good job, done, team disperses, and experts disperse, and then we move on. And then five years later, we have to reassemble everyone and start from scratch. Uh, the methodology needs to be redone. So again, we have to create, how are we going to do this? Um, you're going to see, when I give you an update on kind of our first guideline to more modern guidelines, the technology has changed, the methodology has advanced, our resources and even ways of communication have changed. And we are always creating this again from scratch. And then the other thing that's lost is this institutional memory. So people move on, their research careers move on, the clinical careers or commitments move on, and we lose that, lose that connectivity of this expert panel and team to you know, help you know, with the kind of productivity and meaningfulness of the guidelines. We're trying to avoid that. So a living systematic review and guidelines. So I'm trying to sell you on this thing. This is why it's worthwhile. 
So a living systematic view is defined as a view that is continually updated, incorporating relevant new evidence as it becomes available. Uh, living systematic reviews enable products such as living guidelines, which is what I'm talking about today. So it's really, you know, just in time information, keeping something that's relevant for you. As we used to say when in the old days, when books got published, they're out of date by the time they're literally published because of time through the editorial processes and these sorts of things. And we're trying to avoid that because we want the most up-to-date care we can get. So living guidelines are an optimization of the guideline development process to allow updating of individual recommendations as soon as relevant, as new evidence becomes available. And certainly have numerous examples of that, even within the, the guideline that's only been out for you know, just over a, a, a year or two. So the need for adult concussion guidelines, concussion can result, I don't need to talk to this audience about this, in a disabling symptoms and an unfortunate minority also experience prolonged symptoms. I know in my practice, if, if you ask me, it seems like only people never recover from concussion, but that's my practice. I recognize 90% of people get better following their concussion. And, and, and that's a, obviously a great thing. Early recognition and diagnosis of concussion and proper treatment are needed to optimize outcomes. Um, I can speak to you in, in my practice. Even now, I see things that you know we wouldn't be recommending. Uh, um, I saw a patient the other day Again, I'm still seeing patients uh, who are recommended to go rest and not do any activity until their symptoms improve. I'm seeing patients who aren't having their symptoms treated, you know, even a year, a year and a half after, uh, not even anything addressed in relation to this. So again, there is a need in the community for, you know, guidelines. Adult concussion research is increasing exponentially. Uh, I, you know, we can show you, you know, I've shown you kind of that information and it's hard for people to update. So clinicians and patients require up-to-date and accessible guidance on diagnosis and treatment and management. And I think this is important to us. We want it to be, one, we have to have a trustworthy source of information, which we strive to do. And the second thing is it needs to be accessible. How can you get a hold of this information in timely fashion? Um, just to give you a sense, I was talking to a family physician the other day, and he was, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, information, trying to get people to use tools and guidelines. And he went to a conference that suggested that for a primary care provider, um, if the if for general primary care provider, they would have to wait for um, 27 hours if they went through all the recommendations out of what they should do as a primary care provider for their patients. It would be incredible amount of work to do this. So they need to just be aware the guidelines exist, and that's part of our job to make them available. So the history of the adult guidelines history is always as interesting. Uh, history of concussion is interesting in and of itself. Rec you know, for those of us who are back in obviously in the, the 80s and 90s. Uh, when concussion really, you know, wasn't really believed to be a thing with persisting symptoms. I think, I think we've established that there are persisting symptoms following concussion. In our first edi edition of the con consensus meeting back in 2008 in Toronto, uh, we, br we brought together experts and assembled kind of one of the first guidelines for concussion with prolonged symptoms. And then we first posted it to the, in, in a PDF version, if you will, not a, in an actor web version uh, in 2010 and went on to publish that. Our second edition, because this was based on 2008 information. Um, sorry, I'm not doing that. I'm just going to go back um, to the slide here. I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, so in 2000, the second edition, it came out in 2013, so five years after, uh, made it interactive and searchable PDF version. And our third edition came out in May of 2018. Uh, again, it was a web-based version, and we first created our patient version of the guidelines then using patient-based information. Those are just the covers for those ones. And we are now working on our living concussion guidelines, which are the equivalent of the fourth edition, which came out um, just last year in May of 2023. We were able to update that. And that's this is the current guideline. Uh, and a QR code is there. If people are, have not heard of them or seen them before. And of course, I'm going to talk to you about those guidelines now and uh, about their, their value and hopefully show their utility. Um, Guideline interaction over time. This is just kind of a guide thing. So thanks to Alex uh, Lithopoulos, who's our, who's our uh, coordinator for the program. He kind of created this graph. It's not totally valid. The outcome measures are, are, are slightly different. Just gave you a sense of the increasing, um, hopefully, impact of the guidelines. So the first one we have, in the first edition, we have uh, 262 citations of our first um, guideline article that we published from the first guidelines we produced. And then we're going into views and this like, so not really, uh, fair, fair enough. It's not the best graph, it's one we created, but just giving you a sense of the escalating use of it. In the second edition, 12,500 views. And that's in the past year, on our, since the release of our new edition, we have over 41,000 online views. 
Now we do, we do have tracking software to see where people are going and we can actually see okay, which areas of the guideline are being more readily utilized, what's of interest to people. And this influences us on okay, which section should we update, which one are the kind of the most prescient to update or most pressing to update, I should say. And uh, so moving ahead there, this is just the website statistics over the past year. You know, guess what? They're used most in Canada. Well, they're, they're living concussion guidelines, Canadian experts, this sort of thing, Canada, US, but also um, Australia, Singapore, and, and other countries. And we've had requests to have our guidelines translated. Most popular pages, well, homepage, I guess that's where you end up finding us. And then really um, diagnosis, management of prolonged symptoms, initial management, return activity. And if I had to go to the next one after that, it would be post-traumatic headache. These are the ones that people seem to be struggling with the most. I'm, I'm assuming that's why they're looking it up to get some guidance on how to manage their concussion, their patient with prolonged symptoms. So uh, methods, I think it's important to understand uh, there's a lot of work that goes into that simple, singular, one sentence guideline recommendation. Uh, so we do a systematic review. So we are doing it every six months. It does not necessarily mean that every guideline recommendation is updated every six months, but we're looking through, combing through the information, doing the, the extractions, looking for, should these guideline um, you know, recommendations be updated? And our goal is to do searches every six months, look at and review this information, and then update and minimally on an annual basis with uh, expert review. So we do article screening, data extraction, risk of bias assessments are done through multiple raters and working independently using a published protocol. And if you want to see that published protocol, we have it at the end. Over 40 concussion experts from across North America examine the literature and participate in virtual meetings and online surveys to produce the recommendations, modify the recommendations, and they're also use, utilizing this group to look at kind of what resources should we be offering within our guideline what, you know, web page. So for instance, if we recommend something like you know, depression screening, then we actually, I feel that we need to have at the fingertips of the primary care provider, the tool that they would use for, for depression, depression screening. Um, and uh, so again, uh, you know, we, we try and move ahead with that. So this is where it goes. These are our expert contributors always looking for more expert contributors to, to assist us. And if you do have interest in this, um, it does take some time, but I think we also learn, like I must admit, I love being on the panel uh, when I get there because I get to hear from other concussion experts on how they're moving things. So if you have a, an interest, certainly please feel to reach out um, and, and have something to contribute. That would be awesome because we're always looking for that because these people are volunteering their time. I don't have a budget uh, or we have a budget to, to manage this. So this would identify, this is just our May uh, 2017 to December 2023, just showing you our, our Prisma diagram of kind of what has contributed to our guidelines. So again, we, I said, ChatGPT gave us 5,000 abstracts over the one year, this recognizing that this is over a six year time frame. Um, so matches out five times six, well, 33,000 is what we're coming up with. And we distill it down to uh, 1,283 that we pull the full articles, the full text we pull, and we extract from 1,203 articles to inform our guidelines. So again, our aim to provide, you know, meaningful information for the, this is a systematic review component piece, but meaningful information for our experts to kind of come up with guideline recommendations, recommendations that we can say this should be carried out. And of course, we're gonna rate them in our thing by level A, B, or C, is it based on randomized controlled trials, multiple high, high, um, uh, high quality randomized controlled trials or systematic reviews, that would be a great A rating, or it's just a consensus statement because some direction is needed for management of that symptom, that would probably be a level C recommendation for it. This is kind of a, you know, a screenshot from our current guidelines. These are our major topics in our guidelines section. So diagnosis, initial management, sport-related concussion, diagnosis and assessment of prolonged symptoms, management of prolonged symptoms, post-traumatic headaches, sleep-wake disturbances, mental health disorders, cognitive difficulties, vestibular and vision, fatigue, and then returned activity, work school considerations. We are working, currently we're working right now on developing um, guideline recommendations specific to the older adult. And we are looking at um, you know, another guideline section that is in development in relation to biomarker. So we'll be developing those things, but we aren't quite ready to present that um, on our guideline page yet. So here would be just an example of um, you know, how we manage things and, and the advantage of a living guideline. Uh, you, as you've probably seen, there's been a new, diagnose, uh, new, new diagnostic criteria for the American 
um, Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine in 2023 um, for the diagnosis. And it had been updated since the 1990s. And it was in dire need of this. And through um, you know, experts such as uh, you know, Dr. Bailey, Dr. Silverberg, uh, Alan, um, Grant Iverson, this was a, a great initiative. And our guidelines are able to incorporate this quickly because we have the ability um, to make these changes in a living guideline. So here we go for diagnosis. Um, for there, we can we can incorporate these uh, quickly. Our recommendation here would be suspected concussion should be recognized as soon as possible and referred to a physician nurse practitioner for diagnostic uh, confirmation. In each of the guidelines, we do try and provide context. We had the advantage of these of these when we do these uh, committees, uh, expert committees. We want to give context of where this guideline recommendation is coming from, and we try and further develop kind of explain pearls or tidbits of information that are very helpful when you're kind of applying this guideline recommendation. For instance, headache management section, context, there's been some great discussion, great suggestions. They aren't the guideline recommendation itself because that's a very straightforward, simple um, guideline recommendation, but you always want the kind of background on things. So we try to context and we try to provide level of evidence on each of the rec guideline recommendations, again, to help with their clinical uh, in, in, in input. Um, Next, so for diagnosis here, uh, diagnosis concussion is the first critical step in successful management leading to improved outcomes and prevention of injury. So this would be the context here in the, in the background. And then if you hit, you can see in the blue there, if you click on those, what would happen in our concussion guidelines? I'm not doing a live demonstration because I would notably fail that, but so I, I've done screenshots and it would go to this screenshot. Now this is adapted uh, from the um, you know, from the, uh, you know, the publication of the guideline, uh, the new definition, and this goes through the criteria. And you can see here the algorithm for this criteria. And we've tried to make it um, relatively friendly and, and uh, in, in using this algorithm, but we further went on, and I'm not going to go through this because it's not the point of my presentation today, but we further went through this to try and uh, highlight how you might apply this. So we, uh, through our, um, our team, I think we developed this notion of kind of making it a bit more um, uh, visual friendly on the website. This would be where you go to um, on the criteria. So if I go back to that slide, you're gonna see, uh, I think my, my cursor will show up here. You're gonna see, for instance, criteria, clinical signs, criteria, acute symptoms, and they're showing laboratory findings. And what we're showing here in this next slide is, okay, well, what are those things versus in the just the text of the article? So we've tried to spell those out in a kind of a practical fashion that you can grasp if you're trying to implement this diagnosis, these are the highlighted uh, features from the article in a, in a kind of a bit more uh, easier on the eye and to figure out uh, presentation style. So we go to acute symptoms, clinical symptoms and lab findings. And again, a topic of today is not to confirm or present this diagnosis, just for you to be aware. And of course, um, in advance for helping confirm, do patients have a concussion or mild traumatic brain injury or not? I think very useful and uh, certainly a uh, question there. The other thing I just want to show when we're looking at kind of what utility do the guidelines have? So one, we hope that you have good recommendations that help guide practice and, and uh, have best practice for the patients that we're treating. And the second thing we're trying to do is we recognize there are a lot of things that there's no answer for and that come up with your patients. So we do have a, a newer section is the frequently asked question, uh, a testing ground for emerging or controversial topics. We've done our best at taking this on. Is it totally right or wrong? I'm not sure, but these are kind of questions I don't know that I get asked in my class, in, in my, in my um, sorry guys, yikes, I'm not sure my, my, my mouse is jumping around a bit for some reason when I talk a bit too animatedly. Um, so here just, you know, is herbal medicine an effective treatment for concussion? And we try and go through, you know, what information we've captured for that. It's not in the range that we can make a guideline recommendation for or against, but we can give context and show the evidence that we've been able to find around this topic. Is TBI a risk factor for dementia? And all of you know that uh, TBI and certainly mild TBI is a risk factor for dementia. Uh, but um, we can go and explain that's not a necessarily uh, a guideline recommendation, but information for things that patients might frequently ask you. And we'll go into the current standard for biomarkers. And I'm not going to click and open these because that's not the point of the presentation. But once you know that if you do have questions, for instance, you'd say, well, I'd like that as part of a frequently asked question. I get asked a lot. I'd love you guys to contact me and say, this is something that comes up. And we've got the systematic reviews and the searches and a lot of information. We can often address these things, not to the level that can make a guideline recommendation, but we can address the topic if it's 
you know, challenging for clinicians that you face day to day. So I just wanted to highlight that as, as something we've tried to work on. Key publications, I think part of this has been, we're working with such an expert panel. We are trying to leverage some of the things we've learned and, and these publications uh, to create publications to just help advertise our guidelines and get information out there. I do think that um, if we do have, you know, hits and publications, it showed one, the validity of the guidelines, and two, that's more people, particularly internationally, know they exist. I thought I'd do today, um, you know, as part of this and recognizing is just go through, you know, kind of a practical case study of how you might use the guideline. Now, obviously, this is contrived, and I haven't done it, so I'm guessing on how one might use it, but I'm hoping to kind of walk through and show, you know, what things come out of the guideline that you could utilize to help you in managing a patient. So I'm going to just go through a case. I hope this is appropriate. So a 40-year-old female government worker slipped and fell on ice, striking her head. I'm in auto. We have lots of government workers. Um, concussion diagnosed, and we have lots of ice, by the way. Concussion diagnosed in the ER, and uh, she was told to rest. So she's now three weeks post-injury and has not yet returned to work. So ongoing symptoms include fatigue, concentration difficulties, headache, light and noise sensitivity, and difficulties with screens. And I guess the question is, you know, we've got this person. So there are definitely going to be the symptoms in relation to management, how we're going to manage the headache, how we're going to manage the fatigue, how we're going to manage the noise and light sensitivity. And there are guide, I can assure you, there are guideline recommendations. If that's your primary question, there are in our guidelines to address some of those issues. I'm not going to tell you and work through those specific things. The main thing I'm going to focus on is that this person um, is interested in returning to work, just like everyone else is. And most of us, when we have a concussion, the first thing we're asking is, when can I get over this? When can I go back to work? And this is really kind of looking at, you know, what are things that we can consider? How do we approach this? Um, certainly with allied health, I think in, in your training, you get better information on, you know, return to work and, and those related issues. Unfortunately, I'd say in healthcare, at least my experience with as a physician, uh, probably not as much training. Even in our residency training programs, I don't think it's extremely, you know, well done or focused upon. So this would be an example of where we'd start. Uh, if you go to the return to activity work school section, you would click on as a, I guess I'm the, you know, acting as the primary care provider here, return activity, work, school considerations. And this is kind of our contextual background of things to consider. So general consider considerations regarding rest, return to activity, and general consideration regarding, you know, return to work. Okay, so both important. We're going to focus on, on the work part right now, but just wanted to give a starting point. Do we have references for these things? You can see that there's references there and they're fully available. Um, and links to in relative resources are available if we go to the you know, kind of back to the guidelines section there. On, but this is just the landing page of giving you information to start. And right here, um, we're going to go to th the three first recommendations. Now, some of these aren't necessarily appropriate at the three-week mark. So immediately following concussion, patients will provide a recommendation to avoid a second concussion, particularly during the first seven, 10 days. Well, again, yeah, you don't want them to have another injury. So if they're going back to something that puts them at risk for concussion, I think that that will be the first recommendation. And then the second recommendation, again, an important one, which I highlighted earlier in my talk, I'm still not seeing is after a brief period of rest, we know that patients should be returning to activity. I'm talking to an audience who already knows this, but this is you know, important to emphasize on the spectrum of return to activity, you know, and which is return to work is gonna be included in there. Uh, we need people to start going to resume their normal activities you know, um, promptly within 24 to 48 hours. And we need to explain to patients that transient symptom worsening with increased activity is common. And we're gonna talk about the topic of activity. And I think a lot of people expect that you know, if I have that symptom, I don't think it's, you know, they'll avoid things but and, or be worried about or you know, cause increased anxiety. This is where the education component comes in. But yes, just like uh, if you have sprained your ankle and you walk harder on it, you shouldn't be surprised that maybe you'll have a variation in how your symptoms present. And similarly for concussion, we know that if symptoms are worsening, uh, you know, they can have wax and wane in their intensity. Now, if symptoms are worsening a significant or prolonged, then they need to monitor and have maybe a slower progression to their activities because of their body's telling them something in that recovery. So these are kind of, you know, the top three guideline recommendations. We're going to go to vocational screening and evaluation. So return to work. You're going to encourage patients to return to some form of work, so long as it does not place the person at risk of injury or, or re-injury. So facilitate identification of necessary restrictions, uh, where there's risk of re-injury and appropriate accommodations by clearly limiting, identifying patient symptoms and functional limitations. And again, 
here we have context. We have, you know, Evans indicates that current patient gradually and progressively um, return to some form of meaningful work, provides the opportunity for individuals to establish, maintain routine and structure in their day. And it helps, you know, in not only improvement of their ability to return to work, but their ability to return their symptoms. So we're trying to provide con context there, have given some upfront recommendations there, and have access to some of the, you know, the PowerPoint slides that we have um, in there. And these are resources and, re and references that can be used by the primary care provider or you know, ourselves to help you know, justify why does this recommendation exist and why is the level B um, level recommendation. So here, I just wanna highlight what is the restriction and this is defined within our guidelines. So restriction is performance error in a physical or decision critical task that could result in injury to a worker, coworkers or public and or disruption of equipment, production or the environment. And as healthcare providers ourselves, you know, this is something to, you know, firmly understand what is the, you know, a restriction and how to apply it. Now, a limitation, and this is where we're coming into regards to the balance between the impairment or the symptoms the patient's having and what, you know, and how that affects their productivity or their activity. So activities that are the patient physically, psychologically, and or cognitively is unable to perform, and, and, and that's really what it boils down to. So it may not pose a risk to the worker or others per se, but would reasonably interfere with the ability to perform a given task. So if someone has, you know, extreme migraine type headache and can't, you know, can't um, do a noise light sensitivity and they're doing computer desk work, they may not be able to do the task, but they are not going to harm anyone by, uh, by doing that if they are doing that activity with those symptoms is what we're trying to go with. This would be, again, within our guidelines currently, we are updating the, uh, we're always updating things, and this will be updated shortly to, for, our, for our color coding of our schema on our website. But this would be highlight, you know, slides here, identifying work restrictions and gives examples. So, you know, if for restriction, if they have impaired balance, well, clearly if you've shown on physical exam and patient report, then you'd have them not working at heights. Impaired concentration or visual defects. Well, no operation of heavy equipment would be an example of restriction that might need to be imposed. You would need to know what the worker, what the patient or the worker does. But this is, you know, how you come up with the idea of restriction. And if we're looking at return to work accommodations list, Obviously, we can have a very long list, and we do have some resources there, but fatigue and reduced attention, we're going to look at kind of accommodation, things that can be either one, provided by the employer, or two, can be self-applied by the, by the patient. So for flexible work hours, well, that would have to probably be you know, approved by the employer. Flexible task assignments, again, gradual work re-entry, ability to you know, work from home for one day per week. So those are the kind of things that you could do for fatigue or reduced attention. Um, things like photophobia, you can adjust the, the lighting of the atmosphere that can be done by the patient. It could be done by the employer or the work environment. And then, you know, or proposed step returns to work. The, so those are some examples. And again, I always like to, you know, this slide of Deborah from Aaron Thompson at WCIB, but I just think, you know, for return activity, it is important, as we said earlier, the longer you are um, absent from work, the less likely you return to work. And even at the kind of 50-50 of six months of being absent from work, you have a 50% chance of returning to work. So again, important for people to understand the importance of return to work for both health and ultimate success of return to work. And this information is always important to have to the primary care level. Integrated return to work and healthcare provider. So again, key principles. Um, early and safe return to work during recovery is an important component of the treatment plan. Early intervention is key to preventing disability. Return to work and recovery should be integrated through well-defined plans and programs and it's essential to maintain the employment relationship with the employer and the worker. Okay, so these are some of the, the principles. I think the main thing to take home, and, and we know that within the return to work is, I think it's, it's supported by good work done by Noah Silverberg in a publication, is people who return to work, even with prolonged symptoms following concussion, often have ongoing symptoms. Just like you had some relative soreness in your back or whatever, this does not prevent you necessarily from doing work. You may not be fully recovered in relation to your symptoms, but again, important for you to return to work. And I think the guidelines try to emphasize that. On this next slide, 12.4, this is a new recommendation uh, with evidence to support. So for patients experiencing prolonged symptoms, compensatory cognitive training with supportive employment interventions is recommended to help patients return to employment. Now, first thing is that's I do recognize that that's a short, concise guideline recommendation, but I think it's pretty important to have the context of what we're really talking about. 
So cognitive, you know, compensated cognitive training, essentially saying rehabilitation strategies and, uh, you know, training for the patient has shown to have better results for return to work. The second thing is supportive employment and interventions. We're really talking about employment accommodations. So I usually think of, you know, supportive employment intervention may include workplace accommodations. So again, um, and, or individual placement support, putting things in place to allow the work to be successful. And I think about the first ones in relation to compensated cognitive training aims, that's educating the patient. But at the same time, these are like self-imposed or self-applied accommodations. So planning, keeping lists, well, that's up to the worker or the patient. Pacing, that's up to the worker or the patient. You know, pacing their day, we have some control of that. Decluttering your workspace, again, strategies that can help people function better. And this is shown to be effective. So why is a guideline recommendation? Practical case study, return to work after concussion, we're back to the patient. Ongoing symptoms include fatigue, concentration difficulties, headache, light and noise sensitivity, and difficulties with screens. And what do we do? So the patient was able to gradually return to work over what next one month after us applying, you know, uh, you know, some of these imposing some of these strategies, work accommodations, so work conditions, graduated increase in hours, or employers allowed to allow for that. Work from home was able to be leveraged. Work environment, so natural lighting emphasized. So again, not turning on the overhead um, fluorescent lights. Moving, allow maximizing the low distraction environment and avoidance of group settings and meetings. Um, personal work accommodation strategies. So doing the job differently. So taking micro breaks, prioritization of meetings in the morning. So things that the patient could do at their own personal level that made their turn to work more accessible. The outcome, well, this patient we've initially been seeing at three weeks is able to return to full duties in hours by two months post-injury. So a fairly rapid return, given that the symptoms have been prolonged for a period of time. And after three months post-injury, continuing to work, but still experiencing some symptoms that continue to be on a trajectory of improvement. So again, education, not surprising that some of the patients may have some ongoing you know, relative symptoms there. So I just wanted to highlight here that this is the our website. So Living Concussion Guidelines, there's the QR code for it. I have time in the presentation that hopefully you have a few minutes for questions if there were any at the end, but uh, here I am at the, the end of the presentation. The take home and the conclusion is that the living concussion guidelines can provide recommendations to guide concussion and mild TBI care. We put in information that's hopefully supportive that you can use as a resource and I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. What a ton of work um, and really important for all of us here. Um, does anyone have any questions for Sean? Yes, go ahead, Lynn. Hi, Dr. Marshall. I don't know if you probably can't see us. Not a problem. Um, no, I can't, but I can hear you. It's okay. Hi. Uh, it's Lynn Turkster from McMaster. Oh, hi, Lynn. Um, I have a uh, a question and a request, so I'll say the request first. There's a group of us working in cognitive rehabilitation who are trying to get away from the words compensatory versus restorative for treatments, um, partly because there's no real biological basis for that, but also because it sort of sets the person up to feel like you've given up on trying to fix their problem and now you're on plan B, which is compensatory. So. Um, I think the strategy training guideline is fantastic. So we're trying to just say teaching strategies or strategy training without using the word compensatory. Um, so I'm just putting that out there on behalf of a group of us who are advocating for that. Um, my question for you, so I'm, I'm just wondering, um, based on your experience, um, sometimes people... Uh, sometimes a workplace doesn't really appreciate the complexity of a work task that a person is doing. And one place we've seen it is with online, that sometimes it's not so much I can't work on the computer, but I can't work on the computer when I have 500 emails that I'm expected to answer in an hour. And I wondered if um, your group had looked at the World Wide Web Consortium guidelines for online, use of online resources for people with cognitive challenges. I mention it just because um, all workplaces are supposed to be using these web interface guidelines and they have a lot of really good recommendations. So I, I wondered if that's something that you, your group had maybe come across, guidelines for how to use a computer that isn't overwhelming. 
Um, I can know. So, so Lynn, one about the the compensatory and and uh, restorative. I think uh, you know very important, and I think that um, it, with regards to cognitive, and sometimes they're, I think important. Uh, you know, for for the words and they matter. So I think that it's nice that you point that out. And I think I, I do use those words. I don't, interestingly, I, I, I don't use them interchangeably. I use them as different because I'm thinking sometimes from a physical context. From a cognitive context, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, in relation to the, uh, you know, the, the guidelines, no, we haven't in relation to the guidelines in relation to web interface. And, uh, but I think it would be very interesting in putting those things forward. We spend a lot of time on the guideline with our expert panel, uh, two things. One, looking for useful resources that and and uh, information that can make it um, uh, helpful to people, particularly you know, for instance, the return to work. So I'd be very interested in, in reviewing that. It didn't come up specifically for a concussion when we were doing our literature where we're going, but the resources are different. Like what helps people advance things, and we do have a fairly strict protocol for um, reviewing uh, what resources go into our guidelines. So in fact, we actually do a ranking uh, a ranking exercise with our, with our resources. We actually have a checklist of criteria that the resources have to meet. So, for instance, non-proprietary, they have to be, you know, use, you know useful within a, in, a, in a time frame, and, and, and who can they be used by? So, I think very, very helpful to have resources like that. And clearly, that got that resource would make make it uh, to be helpful. And the other thing is because we recognize if you put too much up there, too many resources, that's right. not helpful sometimes. So, I think that really good point. Now, I'd love you to share that with us. Thanks, Lynn. I'm happy to send that. And I'm not even sure I would list it as a resource. It's more that it had some wording in it mm -hmm. that I was thinking might be helpful for employers. So anyway, thank you so much for doing such a careful job. Uh, it's really impressive. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Lynn. Uh, and we have some chat, some questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, so firstly, do you have a section on vision therapy in your guidelines? We do have a section on, on vestibular and vision therapy combined within the guidelines. So when we do, and we do, and uh, and look at the kind of the evidence as that emerges, uh, and that's changing. I can I definitely say that from the first edition to the most most recent edition, that there that uh, uh, that information that we're providing the guideline recommendations has changed. So and uh, and it's going. So we have a vision vestibular section. We haven't broken the two out separately, uh, mainly because uh, we wanted a critical mass of recommendations. By, by section. So there is a section specific on vestibular and vision-based therapy, yes. And Thank you. Um, there's a, another one. Um, how do you, well, any suggestions about how to advise patients who start new jobs and are reluctant to tell employers that they need accommodations? Oh, to start new jobs and reluctant. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the that's the tough question. I would probably so just be clear. So you said person has ongoing prolonged persistent symptoms and they're yeah. starting a new job and they would function better and be more productive if they had accommodations in place. That's a tough one. I think that's, you know, from a clinical perspective, because there's that um, what do you share and not share uh, with that information? Because it could put you at a disadvantage. I would. Um, Definitely, many of the recommendations for accommodations we put in place are often healthy and helpful for everyone. Uh, so the one thing I would probably do and start with that patient is I would look at uh, a list of accommodations that could be um, self-imposed. And I would actually look at, and I have often taken a patient when you look at these list of accommodations, what ones could be reasonably asked of the employer that could help anyone function better? So we know that, for instance, um, you know, flexible work hours, the ability to work from home, these are not necessarily un, un, unreasonable requests. The main reason I say this, because if we lived in a, in, a, in a very transparent world, I would say, yes, share that information with your employer. But unfortunately, that can disadvantage you for that job. And there are, there are un, un, I think we can all recognize, at least in my experience, there's built in biases and prejudices um, that obviously I think the worker would be shy about sharing. So I think the one place I would definitely start is looking at what could be self imposed you know, accommodations. And the second I'd be is what, what could be asked as reasonable accommodations that they believe the employer could accommodate. So for instance, obviously work from home, if your job is providing care to someone, that's obviously never going to be reasonable, but there's many jobs that would have that. So I, I might go along that track. I don't know if that's very helpful. I'm sure many in the audience would have a different thought, but that's what I would think. And we do have a list of accommodations on the website to help you start. Thank you for that. 
Sean, we just have one minute left. Do you want to take a bunch of quick fire questions? Do you want to sure. try to get through the rest? Okay. And do you have uh, any guidelines on personalized aerobic exercise programs? Um, we uh, personalized. We do have information on, on returned activity, and there's some information there and guidelines on exercise. There are some recommendations there. Yes. Okay. Next. <laughs> Next. Yes. All right. <laughs> and... Um, uh, do you have a section on what type of rehab required and resources for the type of rehab needed and potential where to receive it? So I guess more targeted rehab and locations. We, so yeah, no, we don't right now. So you're talking about, okay, where can you get the resource? So we have information kind of guideline, but we don't have that. It's something I think we'd like to do, but it would take, you know, the resource. It's always, it was really hard to update. So in an early version of the guideline, we did. Then we mm -hmm. had to almost abandon because there's an explosion of resources out there. So we kind of actually just make the guideline recommendation, hope it goes from there. But it would be an aim to actually, again, make that accessible to people. What we are trying to do is, and it hasn't been fully developed yet, is make smart, you know, these smart phrases or recommendations for primary care providers to tell them what to look for. You know, for instance, the type of, you know, even just to know what kinds of therapies and, and what types of clinics would be available. So trying to get that. And also we have a patient guideline which gives some direction from a patient perspective. And these are vetted by patients on, on how to kind of pursue management of their own uh, care and management of their symptoms following the concussion. Okay. That's, are we done? Yeah. Well done. Great. Sean, thank you so much. Wonderful talk. Well, thank you for inviting right. me. Um, it's such an honor. And I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Take care. Thanks, Sean.